and we're going to get out of here because I'm bound and determined to be one of the first people in the line at Outback today. Yeah, that's my goal. It's going to happen. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on the earth. All right, now, most, the little kids are back there, the teenagers are gone. It does me no good to talk to anybody about how to treat your dad today, because the right people aren't here, right? So the dads are here, at least the ones that are here are here, right? So let's, this is your verse. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do not exasperate. That's a powerful word, isn't it? It's a strong word. Did you fathers, let me just ask you dads, did you come here a little bit nervous today? Thinking you're getting ready to get your butt chewed out today. <laughs> Gary just expect. you just know me, huh? I'm not, I'm not going to be too hard on you. I, 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 um, I, I, I may pay some of you back a little bit for uh, um, pointing out what you thought you saw in my shirt today. How many of you guys remember when kids used to buy dad's ties for Father's Day? And you had to wear them you know, the next occasion, right? Well, we we're really not a tie shirt. I'm, a, I'm a, a church. I'm a shirt person. And so my daughter picked this shirt out for me because I love limes. She saw the lime and she had to get this shirt for Daddy for Father's Day. And of course, I had to wear it today. And with my innocent spiritual mind, I'm thinking nothing about it till some of you more carnally minded fellas start coming to the church and say, yeah, all right, Corona. I, it's just a pretty shirt. <laughs> Where some of you see the devil, I see God, okay? <laughs> Fathers, do not exasperate your children. I didn't want to exasperate my daughter by not wearing this lovely gift she got for me. Exasperate, that's a big word, isn't it? Exasperate. And if you, if you have different translations, which a lot of you do, um, you'll see other words in translations, like do not embitter. Your children. Do not provoke your children. Do not offend your children. Do not discourage your children. And the reason that the many translations have those different words is because um, the Greek word that it's translated into exasperate in the NIV means all those things. Don't get your kids all stirred up for nothing. Don't hurt them. Don't offend them. You know, don't provoke them. Don't make them angry for no reason at all. They get angry enough when they become teenagers without any provoking. Just leave them alone. Don't pick at your kids in the wrong way. Don't exasperate. But I love this word, exasperate. It's such a strong word. Do not exasperate your children. I'm a child who grew up in a home where, um, like many of you, there was, there was positives and negatives. There was, there was good and not so good. Um, some of you here knew my, my dad very well. And there was no more of a what I would call a godly man on the planet. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. The man modeled his faith before me. I believe with all my heart that if my dad was not my dad, I would not be your pastor today. I honestly believe that. He modeled faith. He modeled trusting God. When there was a, a situation in our lives, in our family, it was not anybody else's job to step in and commandeer the moment, spiritually speaking. My dad did that. Whether it was a sick child or a sick cow, my dad was the one we saw laying hands on whatever needed laid hands on, and he was speaking words of faith. And I saw him many times pray for dogs that got bit by copperheads and, and cows that were not having calves in the right way. And just my dad was a man of prayer. He was a prayer warrior in... I got to observe that my whole life, at least the life that I can remember, because my dad was not a very godly man when I was a very small child, but I don't remember that. I just remember him after he went to church, got saved, and started serving God. My, my dad was a man who, who wouldn't be like the dad on the screen who was crying watching a Disney movie. My dad wouldn't have showed a whole lot of emotion out there in the secular community, but when it came to um, the stuff of God... My dad was very emotional. If you've been here for a while, you saw him many a time running around the church. Not this building. He never made it into this building. But in the old building, you saw him running around the sanctuary many times, hooping it up, letting out those war cries. 
and, and crying, just, just breaking before the Lord. And I got to witness that. My dad, though, um, we grew up in a season when life was a little different. And now it's just common for both parents pretty much to work more times than not. And, and uh, family life is just a whole lot different. When I grew up, predominantly it was the, it was the dad who made the living. M- most moms were at home. And so because the dad was the only one that worked, there was not such thing as a 40-hour work week. Some of you guys remember that. Nobody just worked 40 hours a week back in those days. Uh, my dad was always, always, always at work. And when we left um, Illinois and we came here and got the farm, if you grew up on a farm, you know what that's like. You were always working. A farmer's work is never done. It's, it's true. And so it was always at work. And so I really didn't grow up in a, in a house um, where a family where my dad was always like taking us and doing sports with us, um, taking us hunting and fishing. We pretty much did that on our own. Um, re- when it came to recreation and entertainment as a whole, my dad was never part of that with us children because he was always at work doing what he had to do to um, supply our needs. And because I have a, a reasonably mature mind, I can look at that and I, I have no bitterness about that. I'm not offended or exasperated about that. It just, it was what it was and nobody thought anything about it. But times have changed. Times have changed in many, many ways. And one of the ways that it has changed is people are getting younger all the time. Their mindsets are staying young. Um, You take someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, somebody my age, um, we're playing the same video games. We're watching the same movies. We, it's the same entertainment, same recreation. It, it, it's not even all that different in how we dress and the cars that we like. It, I don't care if you're or 20 or, or 60. Everybody wants a Mustang, right? Not just Sally. How many is old enough to remember that? Sally wants a Mustang, okay? And everybody wants a Mustang. And there's not the generation gap in there that there used to be. And so because of that, um, a child grows up with different expectations than when I was a child. When I was a child, I had no expectations that my dad should do this with me or that with me. I just understood my dad should be at work making a living. But it's not like that now. My daughter has completely different expectations for me today. She expects that I should spend time with her. She expects that, that I should be the one taking her outside to play, teaching her to ride a bicycle, teaching her to how to do the many things she wants to do. She just understands it's my job to spend time with her and do that. For me not to do that would exasperate her. I was reading back through some notes and some, some, some books and stuff this week. My schooling, academically speaking, was not in um, pastoring, as many of you could probably have picked up on that by now, um, but was in counseling. <clears throat> I didn't go near as far as what Sylvia has. Sylvia is now Dr. Sylvia. And uh, Dr. Wright, I'm sorry, Sylvia. Of course, she doesn't expect that from us, but she deserves it now. She's more than earned that right through all the schooling that it requires. Um, but counseling was my thing. And and, uh, and I loved it. I, I just used to love the psyche of humanity and just delving into it and, and just trying to figure out what makes us tick. And I went back through some old material this week and um, referring to uh, things that could injure a child emotionally, where it could affect them growing up. And, 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 and going through lists of things that we could clinically say exasperates children. And it was real easy for me to go through some stuff and put together a a, a real quick top eight list of things that was common through most writers, most researchers, most books, of things that the the eight most common things that exasperate children, provoke children, make children very embittered and soured towards their, towards their, their, their parents. And in this venue today, we're going to direct that more towards the Father because these things I'm talking about today goes more into the arena of being a father than of a mother. There are other things that mothers can do to provoke children. These are things that are more in the father's arena, the top eight things that provokes, exasperates, offends, discourages, makes a child bitter when it comes to their, do- for their dad. And in no particular order, the first one is this, smothering a child, being overprotective, not allowing them to spread their wings and fly. Now, mamas can do that and get away with it a little more than daddies can for some reason. 
With mamas, it's just expected. Moms are overprotective. My, my daughter understands that, that when she goes to climb up a ladder, she was, uh, and of course, is, uh, Dave's not here, and Dave Emanuel was witnessing the other, the other night at my house and, and laughing about it. I put the ladder up to our house. I got up there to clean the gutters out. And next thing you know, my wife is down there talking to Dave, and she looks up, and the highest point on my house from the, from the peak down, is, as uh, Ron will tell you, is about 30 feet. Um, he restained my house a couple years ago, and we like to never figure out how to get him up high enough with ladders to do this. And I, you are a brave man. I would have never even considered doing that. She looks up, and she sees Hannah on the roof with me, and she's... Being a mama, she's freaking out. And I'm saying, come on, come on, stay close, but come on. And then she says, I can't believe you got her up there with you. I said, this isn't the first time she's been on the roof with me. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I realized that there's many things we say as dads that are just stupid. They're just stupid things we say. And uh, she's like, what, you what? And, and uh, I'm not as overprotective. Now that's an area that's a little more logical in being protective, and it takes the balance of a mom and a dad really for a child probably to survive childhood. <laughs> it's usually when a child starts getting you know, up in the adolescence, closer to the teen years, preteens, and then teen years that a child really wants to spread their wings and, and soar a little bit. And of course, we as parents have to be the judge. We have to be the judge and the jury and all that. And, and uh, we have, it is our responsibility to decide, are they ready for this or are they not? And if they're ready for it, to what degree? And, 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 and you know, there always is moderation when we say, okay, you can do, go do this, but there's always guidelines and moderation. You can go, but you've got to be back by 7 o'clock p.m., you know, and 6 o'clock now, so you better get going now, you know. And... Uh, but one of the things that um, commonly exasperates a child is if a father becomes so overprotective that that child feels like it's not allowed to find its identity on any level whatsoever. And I'll be very honest with you, and almost sad to say, I don't see a whole lot of dads anymore that fit into this category. Um, we may be going extreme the other way. Second thing that I uh, was reminded of that exasperates children is when fathers show favoritism. Favoritism. And that's a topic that we see modeled way too consistently in the Bible, by the way. Fathers who show favoritism. In fact, it's funny how that a, a man can be so godly on one hand and so um, messed up on the other hand. I mean, some of the greatest men in the Bible were some of the worst fathers in the Bible. It's incredible. Who would you say was, just from your, your, uh, your knowledge of men in the Bible, very commonly known men in the Bible, who would you say... Uh, from your knowledge, is one of the worst fathers in the Bible. He, David. David was a terrible father. He was a great king. He was a great worshiper. He was a man after God's heart, but he fell way, 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 way short in the household. He had one son, Amnon, who was really messed up. He was lusting after his sister. And of course, there were multiple wives here, and so there was a lot, of, a lot of siblings, but they were half brothers and sisters. And so Amnon is lusting after his sister um, um, Tamar, and uh, David's doing nothing to keep his house in order, and um, Amnon ends up raping his sister Tamar. The only one that seems to get upset about it is David's son Absalom. David doesn't even seem to get all that upset about it. Um, Absalom gets upset, secretly upset, and he ends up... Um, having his brother Amnon killed, uh, but Absalom, just when you think he's a good guy in this, he ends up being the bad guy. Now he's trying to take his father's throne, trying to kill his own father. And this household is messed up. I'm telling you, messed up. The, the son that turned out halfway decent, Solomon, ended up not being so right in the mind later on after all. For anyone who would have that many wives and concubines, surely can't be completely right in the brain. In fact, he got led astray by his foreign wives later on and, and, and pretty much lost more than he gained um, in the kingdom. But there were many fathers who showed favoritism, and it's funny how that got passed down through the generations. Abraham showed favoritism. He had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and he very clearly showed favoritism to Isaac over Ishmael. And now today we have two great nations, um, religiously speaking, that to this day are at odds. Um, Islam and, and the Jews. And it was even forecast, prophesied back from day one that this was going to happen. They would both be great nations and they'd be at odds against each other. 
And the only and, and, and here's the irony with things like this. We look at something so horrendously big, like, like terrorism and just the insanity going on in, in the Muslim world, and how the Muslims only have one goal in life to kill all the Jews. The Jews have one goal in life to survive the Muslims. And we see all this chaos between these two races, and it goes all the way back to one thing: a father showing favoritism. Isn't that interesting? And it got passed on, and because Abraham showed favoritism, Isaac ended up showing favoritism. He favored Esau more than he favored Jacob. Jacob had to be deceiving to get what he really wanted out of life. And because Isaac was showing favoritism, Jacob becomes a father now, and now he's showing favoritism. And he favors um, Joseph over all the other many sons. And that ended up in the big picture turning out well, but in the household was not well at all. His brothers became very jealous and they threw him in a pit, in a pit and sold him into slavery. If there's multiple children in a family and a father has shown favoritism to one child more than the other children or to all the children more than one child or whatever the case may be, it exasperates children. Children grow up very bitter. And we see just from, from Ishmael, the the longevity of bitterness and how it can carry into the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And now you have a, a, a family that's just completely messed up. I mean just dysfunctional as the day is long. And you go, how did this happen? And you trace it back to a father who showed favoritism to a child. How many of you guys are glad that our Father, God, is no respecter of persons? And he shows no favoritism. I don't care how much you go to church, how little you go to church, how great a worshiper, how little a worshiper, how much you pray and read the Bible, how little you pray and read the Bible. Those things may have spiritual benefits and produce great fruit in life, but when it comes to your daddy, the Bible is abundantly clear. He loves everybody equally. He may not favor everybody equally based on their actions, but he loves everybody equally. The third common reason that fathers exasperate their children is unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. Um, it goes into the area of achievement, that we expect more out of our child than we realistically should expect. Something I've tried, that I've battled a little bit. I, I push on Hannah so hard, and where she's an only child, she gets the full brunt of me saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And by the way, it's very important that, that we are our children's greatest cheerleaders. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Somewhere out there, there's a line. And we need to make sure that we're watching that line. And it's another area where, for some reason, there's a little difference between dad and mom. Moms are pushy. It's just the way they are. It's just the way they are. I don't mean that mean. Moms are pushy. Dads, there's something about a dad. And whether it's a son or a daughter. Maybe a daughter is a little more uh, ginger in her feelings, a little more sensitive. But uh, from what I've seen, there's not a whole lot of difference, whether it's a son or a daughter. Dads are seen the way they are seen in the home. Dads are demand. What dad thinks seems to be very, very important to children. A father's opinion is so important. What a father thinks of a child is so important to that child. And when a child sees that a father has unrealistic expectations, they're saying, no, do this, do this, do this. And the child is saying, but I'm doing the best I can. This is the best I can do. And the child knows that they're telling the truth. And the dad just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. It exasperates a child. It's important for a dad to know where the line is and when to stop pushing. A fourth reason that fathers exasperate their children is dovetailed to the unrealistic expectations. It's in the department of discouragement where a, where a father not only expects too much from a child, but when a child does do good, the father never praises the child. Therefore, the father has become a discouragement to the child. Encourage means, man, you've done good. You're awesome, baby. I am so proud of you. Hannah finished school so good. I mean, we, we had some goals that she would make um, straight A's this year. No B's. We told her B stands for bad. I didn't really tell her that. Well, I did, but then I told her I was kidding. Didn't browbeat her. Didn't, 
didn't lay out any punishments if she didn't make straight A's, but offered lots of incentives if she did. And some of them were, her mama offers her too good of incentive, I think. It's like, I guess I'm a cheapskate. Because it's like, what, you know, there's things that she'll say, Hannah, I'll give you a dollar to do that. I'm going, she'll take a quarter. She'll do it for a quarter. <laughs> and she doesn't get it. But she made straight A's, and, and I thought she had dropped the ball on her final report card because we'd pushed her real hard in reading because I wanted her to um, um, finish with a 3.0, as they call it, um, reading level when she finished. And uh, the last two weeks, she was right on course the last two weeks of school. They, they stopped the, uh, the reading program because of all the other stuff going on, and so she just missed it. But, but we were pushing so many books now, read this book and then go test on it, read this book and go and test on it, that um, we were probably overdoing it a little bit, and she dropped like three points in reading on her last report card. Dropped down to a 93. And I'm saying, baby, you missed it. On the last report card, one grade, you missed straight A's. Then I read the, the fine print, and I found things have changed since I was a kid. When I was a kid, 95 to 100 was an A. And now it was like nine, 93, so she just made it. And it's like, boy, you got lucky. Right, what are we saying? We don't expect as much out of our kids anymore as when we were children? Were we smarter when we were kids, possibly? You th I think so too, Jeff. <laughs> Of course I'm going to think so. No, I could never, I didn't know half the stuff my daughter knows at her age. Um, discouragement. Of all these things I'm reading, there's probably nothing bigger than this one right here. The praise of a father. The praise of a father. I want to say again, as important as mamas are, because no one's going to take a mama's place in life. You know that without me saying it. But mamas are just always praising their kids. It's much more common for a mama to praise the children, okay? Oh, oh you did so good. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, that dress. Uh, dads, dads just don't throw it out there like that. And so when a dad says something, it really sticks. And when dad says something, somehow it's heard in a little different way than when mama says it. My daddy just told me I'm pretty. Mommy always tells me I'm pretty, even when I know I'm not. Daddy just said, oh, baby, you're so pretty in that dress today. Oh, you did so good on this report card. Oh, I'm so proud of you. It is so encouraging to the child. The probably most common way that fathers exasperate their children is just by discouraging them, by never praising them, and only pointing out their failures. A fifth thing that fathers do to exasperate their children is called value imbalance where we devalue our child, and this is how we do it. And I thought it was interesting in that. That was a, that was a powerful video that you showed, by the way. The, the, the second one was too, but the first one, the serious one, you got your dad sitting there. He's looking at the brochure of a new what? Mustang. Mustang. <laughs> you got a Mustang. And they've got a Boss 302, and who wouldn't want one, right? And we can't tell what the other paper is, but he's looking. This is a Mustang. This is some other paper. Mustang, some other paper. He makes his decision. He throws the Mustang in the trash. Sh close up of this paper. College. Tuition. Savings account. When a child sees that a father chooses things that he wants over things that the child wants, um, it makes the, the, the child feel devalued. The father is seen as being more important than the child. How many of you guys would be very, very, very exasperated today if you thought our Father God was like that? What He wants comes first. What we want isn't that important. How many of you guys really, really want God to put us first? You want that? I want that. It's not a trick question. Anyone that doesn't want God to put you first, there's something wrong with you. God has set the pattern. God puts us first. And for a father not to do that, and for a child to continually see a father going out and spending money on stuff they want, and they can't get anything that they're asking for, whether they need it or not. Maybe it's just something they want. You go, well, that's just stupid. But then what do we do? We go out and we buy our toys. And our toys are a lot more expensive than their toys. They want something that costs 10 bucks, and we're going, oh, you don't need any more toys. Then we turn around and buy a big flat screen TV for $1,500. And if a child keeps watching that and watching that, that any time the father comes into a lump of money, the father's out spending everything on himself. 
And the child's really getting nothing special. In fact, not the top of the list. Because I'm telling you how it should work. Daddy gets a bonus, and if daddy's going to blow some of it, the first two stops on the shopping trip better be mama and the kids. And for a man to go out and spend his makings on himself to benefit himself and pleasure his own life, it is noticed by the rest of the family, and it is not good. A sixth thing that fathers do to exasperate their children is called growth acceleration, where we won't let our kids just be our kids. It's, it's a little different than just not allow, smothering them where they can't spread their wings and fly. This is, this is where we're, they're, they're eight and we're trying to get them to act like 12. How many of you guys have learned it's going to speed up enough on its own without our help? I hate the fact that, that, that the major TV shows that little kids want to watch are shows about teenagers. It, it causes growth acceleration. It's not good. My daughter's seven years old. She's not ready to watch the, the social activities of teenagers. She can't relate to that. And it'll get her ahead of schedule. So I don't want her to get ahead of schedule. I'm actually trying to... I want her to be smart. I want her to excel in everything she does. But I want my daughter to be seven years old every single day she is seven years old. I don't, I, don't expect, I don't expect to leave home and leave my daughter there by herself and say, well, you can take care of yourself. She's seven. I want her to know she's seven, and I want her to act like she's seven. And I, I joke with her all the time because she'll start acting silly and weird. You know how kids do, and I'll go, man, you act like a child sometimes. And she'll say, Daddy, I am a child. And I'm kidding, and she doesn't always know that I'm kidding. Some parents need to hear that, though. Daddy, I am a child. Let me be a child. Because I'm telling you, there's no reverse on this thing, man. This car ain't got no reverse. And once they get a certain age, they're not going to back up. Once they get 12, they're not going to be 7 again. I'm already wanting to push my daughter back to 4 years old because I, I wanted her to dance today. And I've been pushing her for weeks. Come on, daddy's going to play a song and you're going to dance. How many was here about two, a couple of Father's Day ago and three... Mother, I mean Mother's Day, like three Mother's Days ago or something, and she was four years old. At four, she would do anything I asked her to do. Baby, you're going to dance on Mother's Day. Okay, Daddy. She put her little, Erica took her back and put her little uh, Chinese ballet dress on, and she came up here, and oh, she just twirled around, and she just was, she still dances on the big stage, you know, for, for, with all the other little girls, but the, now it's like, come on, you're going to dance for Daddy and all the other daddies. No. No. And I, would, and I would start, I got a piano at home, and I would play, and say, now get out in the middle of the room and, and, and work on your moves. And oh man, she would get mad. She got exasperated. <laughs> I finally just backed off. I saw this is not going to happen, that if I keep pushing this thing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have very negative effect. She's not going to even want to go to church Father's Day. Then she's not going to want to go to church the next Sunday or the Sunday after that. I'm beginning to exasperate my child, and I thought wisdom here would say back off. Stop trying to get what you want and back off. She's seven. She's going through whatever seven-year-olds go through. She'll grow out of it. And then she'll go through whatever eight-year-olds go through. It's important for us to let them grow. Let them be kids. A seventh thing that we do as fathers um, that exasperates our children is called love manipulation. It's when we only show favor when they're good. And we push them away and reject them when they're not so good. Children notice that. Now, again, we're comparing ourselves as earthly fathers to how we want our heavenly father to be. How many of you guys want God to be this way with us? Only be close to us and be nice to us when we've really earned it and reject us and push us away when we haven't earned it. How many of you guys would say that you'd mostly be away from the father's table? Because I don't know what it takes to impress the creator of the universe, but I'm pretty sure I don't do it very often. What does it take to impress the creator of the universe? Where he would look at me and go, wow, Scotty, man, I'm so impressed with what you just did. What can I do to impress God? So if I have to measure up and earn the right of his affection for him to show me favor all the time, I'm in trouble. It exasperates children when it becomes very obvious to them, you only love on me and you're only nice to me when I've done something really, really good. 
And when I'm not so good, I notice that you push me away and you punish me by not allowing me to be close to you. If God were like that, we'd all be in trouble. I am so glad that God does not push me away when I have not earned His love and His affection. It exasperates children when they see that Daddy only loves them when they've earned it. And when they haven't earned it, Daddy rejects them and pushes them away. An eighth and final thing that fathers do that exasperates children is the no-brainer department. It's, it's physical and verbal abuse. That one we don't really have to talk much about, right? Prayerfully, there's not any children in this house going through physical abuse. If there is, and we find out about it, dads, you need to know we have a special ministry and we will be coming to see you. Um, we used to joke about that years ago until there was a household where abuse was going on and I let the cat out of the bag and, and some of our bigger brethren found out about it and they really wanted to go pay him a visit. And I said, well, what are you going to do when you get there? It's like, well, we're going to kind of show him what it's like. <laughs> it's like, we can't do this. We can't do this. We do need to go talk to him, but we just need to talk to him. Now, with that said, um, it would not surprise me if there are not multiple families in a church this size where children are being verbally abused. It's very common. Children being screamed at. Children being called stupid, being called idiots. Children being berated verbally by their parents. And I want to tell you this again, and I, I, I'm sorry that I keep separating mama from daddy, because again, we're, without mamas, we couldn't make it. And I mean, and, it just, and I regret it after Mother's Day that, that we left here without me paying special tribute and special attention to the many mamas in this place that are having to do it alone having to do it alone. We bless you. You're awesome. And if I'm not talking about you, that's wonderful. But more kids than not are pretty used to mama screaming at them consistently. Mamas holler a lot. I you might have to edit this because my mom's going to watch this. My mama hollered a lot. <laughs> Everybody's mama did. And I'd go to school and someone would say, yeah, my mom was hollering at me. And we'd go, well, yeah, so was ours. All mamas hollering. <laughs> you kids, get in here right now! It can never be children. Would you like to come in the house now? It can never be that. I mean, out on the farm, it just echoed across our 200-acre farm, man. My mom's voice just echoed. And everyone knew what she wanted and what you were supposed to do. My dad was a very soft-spoken man. My dad carried great influence in my life and, and my brothers also. If my, man, if, my, if my dad would have been a screamer, I think it would have really affected me. With my mom, it's like, it's just what moms do. We thought nothing about it. My dad carried a completely different position in my eyes. And if my dad would have verbally, and I'm not saying my mom verbally abused us because she didn't. She just, that's just mama's, okay. But... When dads can do those same things, it really comes off in a very abusive way. It really does. And for a father to verbally abuse a child, you're talking about some scars, some tissue damage to their emotions and their minds and their hearts. To verbally abuse a child, we know the Bible is abundantly clear about how our words contain life and death. And when we speak death over a child, it's bad enough coming from any parent but as God has put His order in place in the, in the family, in the father's position, when a father speaks death over a child, it's not just a natural thing, it becomes a very spiritual thing. And I have spent endless, endless, endless hours, and Sylvia, I know you have too, with people who were just, who were just broken inside and have been broken, some of them, for many, many years. And how often it goes back to childhood being verbally abused by a parent, especially a father. Verbal abuse cripples, cripples the whole future of a child. It exasperates them, it discourages them, it makes them bitter, and it offends their spirit. What is it that we need to be as good fathers? It means being whatever we want God to be to us as a father. 
And I am very sorry for anyone here today that when we speak about God as a father, and, is that, and that's the pattern of, of, of God being so good because He's presented as a father. And it was, it was many, many generations into biblical history before God ever referred to Himself as a father. He was given humanity time to learn the father's role and what a father was supposed to be as a protector and a provider, one who would guard the family, one who would be the one responsible for the family, for the children. And God gave many generations of experience to humanity before He said, by the way, I am your Father. I want you to understand me in this capacity as a Father. And some of you don't have good memories when you hear the word Father because you were verbally abused. Maybe some of you here, very likely with the adult crowd here today, there are at least a few of you that can very much relate to physical abuse by a mom and even worse, a dad. And you've grown up with Father not being a term of endearment on any level. And we talk about God being a good father. You can't relate to that because you didn't have a good father. Some of you didn't have a father at all. And so you can't relate to God as father. But here's where we're all at as adults today. We all have at least some active brain cells where despite our past, it's easy for us to imagine, at least imagine, what it would be to be a good father. Even if we didn't have a good father, through life experience now, watching TV shows, reading books, seeing other patterns, even if we didn't have it, we know how to define what it would mean to be a good father. And so dads, how do you define God as being a good father? Because that's how your child will define you. Exactly how you would say, this is what would mean God is a good father, if God would be this to me. That's exactly what it means for you to be a good father to your children a good provider, a protector. A protector without them even having to ask. We, were, we had an awesome, awesome day yesterday. My, my wife and my child had a, uh, just a really neat Father's Day surprise planned for me. And, and uh, I wasn't expecting, I didn't know. They stuck me in the car and they said, okay, let's go. And, and we went on a little adventure together. And we went up um, to first Little Beaver State Park because we'd never been there. And there wasn't a whole lot there. But then we went to to this hidden jewel that's been right up the road all these years, and I had no idea. I've been to the amphitheater before, but I'd never really been to Grandview State Park. I had no idea why they called it Grandview till yesterday. I told her, I said, I feel, I feel stupid here. I said, we've been to, to, to Jamaica and Puerto Rica and Costa Rica, all these places with these... With these um, with these rainforests going on these big long hiking trips, hiking up to volcanoes through these rainforests, and just like, ooh, and all and stuff. And I'm telling you, I was on trails yesterday that made all of those hiking trips in other places look very boring. And the view down into the gorge and the river and, and just uh, hiking through the cave passages, and, and just, it was, it was mind-blowing. And from there we said, okay, now we're, we've been looking down at the river long enough Let's go down to Sandstone and let's get in that river. And we left and we got on 64, went around through, came up through Hinton and, and went down to Sandstone State Park and went down to the falls down there. It's like, okay, now let's get in this thing. And, and I told Hannah, so kick off your shoes, baby. We're going out on the falls. And of course, Mama's like, what? Will you all be careful? It's like, I grabbed my daughter's hand and there was times that you know, she couldn't step across a little rift of current to get from this rock to this rock, and I would have to straddle and grab her and pull her up. And you know what? Not one single time out there in a situation that could sweep you away over the falls at any given time, one wrong move, not one single time did my daughter have to say, Daddy, protect me. My daughter knows I'm going to protect her. I'm going to protect I'm going to guard her. And not just physically, but I, I will attempt with as much wisdom as I can through the years, especially teenagers, to protect her, even as I'm trying to protect her now emotionally, guarding her with certain things that I don't think she's ready to see yet. Um, I'm going to try to guard her. And I want God to do that to me. I want Him to guard me even the times that I'm too ignorant and stupid to know that I need to be guarded from something. I'm at peace knowing He's going to guard me. We know what it means to be a good father, even if we didn't have a good father to provide for us, to take care of us, to love us, to accept us, to, to encourage us, to praise us. To be our primary discipline in life. Dads, 
Stop handing the baton off to mama. I'm telling you, as God is my witness, you have been seated by God to be the primary disciplinary of your household. Solomon said, if the fathers don't exercise the proper discipline, the children will grow up to be an embarrassment to their mother. It was the dad's deal. It was the dad's deal. It's the dad's deal in discipline. I don't just mean correcting and punishing. I mean getting in there and teaching how to do something. The disciplines of life. The disciplines, whether it's the stuff you don't want to do, but you've got to do it, someone's got to do it, or the stuff that's like, oh, I'm going to teach her how to build a birdhouse today, teach little Joey how to build a little, little soapbox car or whatever, and the fun stuff, you know. It's dad's job. My wife was reminding me yesterday because we look in the back seat, Hannah's sitting in her booster seat, and she's cool, calm, and collected. She's just looking out the window. And we, were, we started reminiscing a little bit, and she started reminding me, you know, of those first couple of years when that child would not stay in her car seat. Anyone have a kid that would not stay in their car seat? Now, I didn't grow up with car seats. They threw us in the back of the station wagon <laughs> with a bunch of pillows and quilts, and we made a bed and a fort and everything else, and... I don't remember that many of us dying, to tell you the truth. Of course, back then the cars were made out of real steel, and if you hit someone, there was just a little dent in the hood. Now they're totaled if you do that. And so we were going somewhere down through Tazewell or something one day, and this child, she's two years old, about there, would not stay in her car seat, and I've had enough. Mama has nagged and nagged and nagged. It's time for Dad to step in. I pull over. It just so happens I have a roll of duct tape. And I duct taped my child into a car seat. And if we got pulled over, I promise you, if that state trooper was a father, he would have looked in there and would have just said, I understand. I understand. You got to do what you got to do. If you got to duct tape your child into the car seat, if they're 16 years old and they're trying to get ahead of schedule and their dating patterns... There's still duct tape. <laughs> and if the boy wants to come over, the boy can come over. And she can sit in her chair, duct tape to her chair. We can duct tape to him chair. They'll be close enough proximity, they can still talk. <laughs> when they're 21, we'll duct tape them close enough together where they can hold hands. We've got to do what we've got to do. The explanations of life, the teachings of life. We've put this off on other people too much. It's not the, it, there's certain things that school teachers can do, Sunday school teachers can do, mama can do. There's things that I need to be the one doing it. It's my job as a dad and as a father. I need to be the primary. And it's funny because my daughter is always coming to me, and, and almost in an unfair way. She comes home with two questions this week one for mom and one for dad. Mom gets the easy one. Mommy, what's gravity? Mommy gets the easy one. They, oh, you think there's something harder than explaining gravity? So she comes to me, she says, Daddy, what does it mean when you stick your middle finger up at somebody? <laughs> Why couldn't I get the gravity question? I'm thinking, I don't know right out of the gate how to explain gravity, but I can do a whole lot better job than this question. And I didn't know what to tell her. But I had to tell her something because she had already seen that, pe that her friends were getting in trouble at school when they did that. She gave me the little boy's name. She said, he stuck his middle finger up and, and Miss Myers sent him to the office. She said, what does that mean? I said, well, it's not good, baby. She said, I know it's not good, but why isn't it good? She, sa she said, it's just a finger. So I had to make something up because you've got to do that sometimes. It's not like I... <laughs> I couldn't tell her the truth. <laughs> so I told her, I said, it means that you hate someone and you wish they were dead. Because I had to make it as extreme as I could so she wouldn't do it. <laughs> I had to come up with something because I'm dad. And I couldn't just say, I don't know. Dads can never say, I don't know. Moms, feel free. Say it all you want. I don't know. Then they'll come to dad and say, dad, and we have to come up with an answer. Right, Jonathan? I can't imagine four of them coming home at different times asking those same questions. <sighs> it's Dad's job to teach. Ephesians 6, 4 just ended with that it was the Father's job to raise the children in the ways of the Lord and teach them. It's the Dad's job. It's Dad's job. 
It's dad's job. It's dad's job. And the promise, he said, and this comes with a promise. And the promise, if you know the word, was that, that if a child would respect their parents, and if the father would truly be a father and raise that child in the ways of the Lord, they would be a blessed house and they'd be fruitful for generations to come. But God, you know, in His book to us, God put the full, full, full responsibility of spiritual discipleship on the dad. Moms, what you do is awesome and great. Don't stop doing it because in a lot of houses, that's the only thing that's happening. But God put full responsibility on dads to spiritually train your children. Now, I want to tell you something before we close and before we pray for, for you dads that are here today. There's some very unusual things happening, um, biologically speaking, in America today with little boys. And... Uh, Sylvia, this would have made a good doctorate thesis. You know, we talked before about endorphins and stuff like that and, 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 and that, how that explains a lot of what's going on with people with addictions and all kinds of things. And be, someone needs to do a good paper on that. Very closely related to that is there's, there's little, little hints of studies being done now, but no one's really putting the material together because they're not sure what to do with it yet and how to present this to America. So there's just pieces of this study going on, how testosterone levels are dropping in American boys today from adolescence on up through the teenage years early early adolescence up through teenage years testosterone of course is the is the hormone it's in it's in boys and girls but it's 50 times higher in boys than girls and you know these hormones whether it's estrogen in a woman or testosterone in a, in a boy it's what makes us boys and girls basically you know testosterone is what uh, makes men develop um, muscle mass completely different from, from girls, facial hair, body hair of all kinds. Um, it's what gives us a very competitive drive. Um, testosterone. Testosterone. Testosterone, to some degree, is automatically produced just because you're born with the, 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 the gene pool of a boy. But testosterone is a hormone that that can, and to some degree, has to be provoked. You provoke it. What you're mostly familiar with is, is working out. That when a guy works out, especially with the larger muscles, like from the waist down in his, in his quads and stuff, that when a man works out, it produces testosterone. You know that? How many of you guys know that? So when you work out, you get pumped up. It's more than a figure of speech of pumping up your muscles. It's actually also pumping up your testosterone. And so um, there are certain things that when guys do, it, it creates testosterone and releases it. There's a direct connection on some level, everyone's arguing about to what degree, between the, the, uh, the excretion of, um, of uh, adrenaline. Sorry, my, my brain went blank. That when you do something to release adrenaline, that that also aids in the, in the production of testosterone in boys. So here's what's going on. We've come out of, out of past generations where boys at a very young age were taught to fish, hunt, wrestle, fight, um, do all kinds of stuff. They're out there, they're, they're, they're riding horses, they're wrestling cows, um, they're doing all kinds, they're, they're serving in the military at very young ages. There's all kinds of things going on that's producing testosterone where prior to this generation, men were basically very manly men. Very manly men, you know, just tough men. Guys would go off to war. They would see horrendous things, hand-to-hand -hand combat, very different from today. Mo more guys than not knew what it was to be eye-to-eye -eye with their enemies often. And would come back, a lot of guys seeing things messed up, but they would come home, and even though they were dealing with things, they would predominantly do what they would have to do to try to find adjustment within themselves because they knew they had to come back home, pick up where they left off, and start providing for their families. You begin to notice in this current generation that things had begun to change. Guys were coming home from war much different. Um, it, the big study, though, was in the adolescent to teenage kids where they began to notice that boys weren't as macho as boys used to be. And what has been noticed is that, um, to, to make this very simple and just clear the dust and tell you what's going on, where fathers are not spending time with their sons roughhousing, 
playing ball, playing sports and stuff like that, then the boys are not producing the same levels of testosterone they used to, and so boys aren't quite the boys they used to be. It's common now for a teenage boy, instead of being out doing very adventurous, competitive, even dangerous stuff, to be holed up in a bedroom day after day after day playing video games. You see, that, that's the adventure. That's the only adventure they, they, don't, they don't need. They don't need to feed the man genes anymore. They're, they're content. Now, when you get older, much older than I am right now, your testosterone levels automatically begin to drop, and suddenly you're not as adventurous as you are anymore. You want to sleep a little more, and you're very content just to sit and stare at a TV all day long. All kinds of drives begin to deplete. That's okay when you get old because it comes in handy because testosterone is the main cancer-feeding agent in a man, and so it helps you survive longer because you don't have as much testosterone when you get older. But when you're young, if you don't have those high levels of testosterone, you're in trouble. Now you're working on a job, and it's just like you don't care if, if you compete in that job and if you climb the corporate ladder or not. You're just there to get a paycheck so you can go back home and play with the Wii and watch movies. And people are looking at this going, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And you keep chasing this dog back. And the, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the studies are going to be released in mass quantities very, very soon. It's going to go back to one thing. Fathers are not spending time with their sons anymore. They're not getting down on the floor. I remember as a kid, my older brother and I, my dad would get down on the floor and he would get down on all fours and we would jump on him and we would wrestle. My dad was always a very muscular man. And just, but he would let us beat him up. And then he would take us and he'd throw us around and mom was like, you're going to kill those kids. And Oh, honey. Yeah, so what I, that was dad's. I heard that a million times. That was always dad's comeback. Oh, honey, they'll be fine. Heard it a billion times. Oh, honey, they'll be fine. Rough house. Wasn't the kind of dad that had the time to go play ball with us much, but when he was home, he rednecked us big time. And it produced some testosterone, and so all of us sons grew up really competitive. <laughs> and there may be a line in there where you can cross it, but we grew up very competitive. Dads, listen, 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 listen. I know I'm talking about just sons right now, not as much with daughters. We don't need them to produce more testosterone, or they'll be shaving their little mustaches off. Um, we've got to spend more time with our sons. It's imperative. We, in churches like this, we've got to get activated, reactivated, more consistent with doing father and son things. More camping trips and, and, and more stuff that we're doing with just dads and sons. And we're going out and, and we've got to wrestle with them more and we've got to play ball with them more. Our, our boys are growing up and they're not being boys the way God designed them. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to promote some kind of macho thing here. It's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to say God created male and female. He created them to be certain ways. And boys are supposed to grow up. Not that, not that everyone's interest has to be the same, but it should be, it should be common that a boy should grow up um, with a competitive edge, ready to face enemies, ready to protect, ready to provide, ready to become that in his family. And a lot of boys aren't that because they did not have fathers teaching them that and setting that model. We've got to change this thing. We've got to reverse this thing. It's time for the sons to return to their fathers and the fathers to return to their sons, as the Bible says. It's time. It's time. We've got to do this. We've got to get intentional about it. And we've got to do everything we can at Cornerstone to help feed that fire and promote this, okay? With that said, with that said, I want to end on this note about daughters. Dads, it's all about you, buddy. Their dating life is going to hinge on what kind of dad you've been. Show them how a guy is supposed to treat them. I open the door for my wife. I open the door for my daughter. I grab my daughter's hand. I help her out. I'm trying to show her. And I tell her, this is how boys. I say, if you ever date a boy and he doesn't do this, you tell him to take you home. You tell him, say, my daddy treats me better than you do. You tell him that. <laughs> treat her like a lady. Treat her like a lady. Take her on down. I, I love you, man. This dude dates his daughters. Tell me that is not cool. Takes them out, shows them this is how it's supposed to be done right here. Every dad should take their daughter out on an occasional date. Just the two of you. Show them how it's done. Dads, guard them. Protect them. Don't leave it up to just mama. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I told you on Mother's Day. Mamas, I know you're getting educated here. Mamas don't always know that some things um, 
are as risque as we guys understand they are. I watched these girls up here do these dance moves um, when, in the, the class that Hannah's in, but not that age group, the older age group, teenage girls, and I just cringe because I know there's dirty old men sitting out there, and those little girls are doing all those moves, and they think it's very innocent. To them, it is innocent, and it's as risque as, as the day is long. Mamas don't always know when something is inappropriate because they've never been boys. They don't know how boys are. They, know boys, they don't understand boys can't go five seconds without a sexual thought. If they're lucky, they're going five seconds. Nick, am I right? What you up to now, seven seconds? <laughs> mamas don't think that way because mamas have never been boys. I'm telling you, ladies, no matter what you think, you can't even begin to relate to the sex drive of a man. We don't go any time without thoughts, 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 thoughts. And, and when you get older, you, you, hopefully you learn how to harness and discipline that stuff. But when you're young, especially a teenager, there is no motivation to harness or discipline anything. Just release, release, release. And the things that our girls wear, and some of the suggestive moves, and some of the I'm telling you, we're setting our children up for a mess. Dad, step in. If she goes to walk out the door wearing something that you are not comfortable with, Dad, and they said, Mom said it was okay. Say, but I'm Dad. I'm telling you, it's not okay. Go change. I'm wi Gary, I'm willing to risk my daughter getting mad at me and even saying, I hate you. I'm with you, brother. I'm willing to risk it. I'm willing to risk it because that's what God does to me. God does things to me all the time that makes me go, you're not fair. <laughs> Am I alone here? What? <sighs> got to be dads. We got to be men in our homes. Provide for our families. Be the rock of our homes. Be the role model for our children. They should see us pray. Us read the Bible. Us read the Bible to them. Protect them. Guard them. Provide for them. Do nice little favors for them. Treat them good when they're bad. Treat them good when they're good. Always treat them good. Discipline them when they need it. Even with the tough love stuff. Be dads. Be dads just like we know God is our dad. If you're a dad here today, I want you to come up here with me. I want to pray for you. I hate there's so many dads gone today. I, I don't mean this in any kind of bad way. Cornerstone has always been such a guy church. And that's a good thing, by the way. It's a return. It's happening all across America now. We're returning back to something that we lost in the church where you go into the local church and it's full of men, Ron. You, and I don't mean just males, I mean men. Guys that hunt and fish and kill stuff. <laughs> shoot guns and play football and... Yeah, man, look at these guys, man. Look at these guys. <laughs> you brought your daughter with you, didn't you? I like that, man. I like that a lot. Guys, I love you. You guys are more awesome than what you even realize. And I suspect even in our current state of awesomeness, we've only begun to tap our potential. There's more in there. There's nothing, Michael, that's going to be more fulfilling in your life than when you take Chris and the other three kids that you haven't had yet. I probably shouldn't be saying anything about that yet, but this is this problem when you're a prophet. You can't keep things... Your, no, I'm just... There's nothing more fulfilling than spending time with your kid. Nothing. I don't even want to do anything with that. I, that's why, I haven't done a missions trip since we brought Hannah home from China. I just don't want to leave her. I don't want to go anywhere. Now we've got these phones that we can look at each other and talk to each other, so now maybe I guess I can go somewhere. There's nothing more fulfilling. And sometimes it's real fun, and sometimes it hurts. Hurts, hurts. Didn't understand what my mom was saying. Well, when I, it hurts me more than it hurts you. Now I understand. But you've got to do what we've got to do. We've got to be dads. Can I ask you to do something real macho here?